Good morning once again and welcome to um, my session on an automatic prediction engine or a mechanism that can help you offer recommendations to the visitors to your website or inside your application. Actually, its users are much, much wider than what the title suggests. But let me quickly introduce the session and myself. To those of you who haven't met me in the previous session on data mining, which we had this morning, my name is Rafael Lukaviecki. I don't work for Microsoft. I work for a small consulting company based in Ireland called Project Botticelli Limited, where I've worked for the last nine years. And in the last three of those nine years, I have specialized in business intelligence, notably in the area of data mining, which is one of the perhaps narrower and less known uh, uses of BI technologies, but uh, definitely very powerful. It brings artificial intelligence into your application, and that's what I want to talk about right now. In this session, I have, uh, roughly speaking, three objectives. First of all, I would like to very briefly overview market basket analysis. This is a session at level 400, so I'm assuming you know something about the area. I'm not going to be talking about obvious things. Secondly, and this is the big one, I want to introduce association rules algorithm technique in detail. We will be looking at how it works, the results it provides. I will dispel some issues that's, uh, that frequently concern it and misconceptions. And of course, I will show you this is the thing no doubt all of you need to use in your application, how to make predictions using that model. Uh, so we will use associative technique to generate a model and then we will be using that model to make predictions. Those predictions in essence are the recommendations and that's the plan. So let me introduce the process straight away. Step one, you need to prepare your transactions, your historical database representing whatever happened, for example, receipts from sales in a supermarket if you want to use a supermarket scenario, but of course, it doesn't have to be for selling things. It could be recommendations for experiences, demographic recommendations, and so on. So whatever the data is, you need to prepare it first for mining. That typically means cleansing, flattening, and denormalizing, as no doubt some of you already know. Then you will create and train an associative model using association rules. You will test and validate it. So far, nothing different from a normal data mining process. Here, step four, comes the heart of your application. Somewhere in the code of your application, you will use the model to perform a recommendation. And the trick is the prediction joint semantics. That is the engine. The engine for recommendations is one prediction join. That's what we will discuss in detail because many people consider prediction joins easy, but associative prediction joins cause trouble. Uh, that's probably partly even because um, most of the examples Microsoft has in SQL books online don't work. So some people even find it difficult to find how to write it the first time you see it. Not to worry, I'll show you all of that um, uh, working and in a demo in a few minutes. Optionally, you could make in, steps, in step five, your application depend on the outcome of a prediction. So sometimes you want to say, people who bought this were also interested in that. But sometimes you don't. Sometimes you just want to know, uh-huh, so this customer is in this group. That's the interest they have. Therefore, we will offer them a special discount or do something else. So remember, predictions are not just cross-sell, although this is the bread and butter of predicting in terms of recommendations. Do not forget, you must update and revalidate your model because the world changes. What is popular now will not be cool two weeks later. So if you want to make the correct predictions in two weeks and the children or other people buying the toys from your store change whatever it is that's cool, you need to react to it. And the way to do it is, of course, to retrain the model and revalidate it to make sure that it's okay. How often? Some people say weekly or monthly is okay. Some people do it on a daily basis. If you have the computational power, daily doesn't hurt or nightly doesn't hurt, but it's often not necessary. You will not find that tastes change that fast, but they may. For example, if you are in the business of mobile telephony and you want to provide a promotion for sending an SMS message, if there was a program on the Norwegian television last night as a result of that program, people may change their habits next day. So there are businesses in which re-validating and updating the model is necessary on a more frequent basis. Okay, 
Market basket analysis, let's quickly introduce it. The question here is, what makes some of our products more successful and can we recommend other products based on uh, whatever customers are doing? So not based on what you think they should be doing, because that's where we typically fail, but based on exactly what happens out there. How can you spot the trends emerging? Now, it's called market basket analysis, but it is widely used not for selling. It's used not just for selling, I should say. Of course, it's used extensively for selling, but it's widely used outside of the selling scenario. So demographic analysis, analysis of preferences, analysis even of uh, behavior such as language uses market basket analysis. You can use it for fraud prevention. So I am showing you a technique that's really canonical, that applies as a pattern in a wider sense than just cross-sell. Easiest way to understand it is, of course, to see it. So let me switch over quickly to the demo to explain what's going on. So what are we looking at over here is, uh, first of all, we'll start easy in Excel, then we'll turn it a little bit uh, heavier. What you are looking at here is uh, sales, receipts. You can see that order number 61269 was for two items, a Sport 100, which is a helmet and a long sleeve logo jersey, which is a jersey. They were sold for that price and effectively we sold two things in that order. If I scroll to the very bottom of this table, you will see that I don't have much data, only 32,000 line items representing on average three items per order. Therefore, you see I have about 10,000 orders here. The question is, what sells with what? For example, you can see that this order, let me scroll to the very top so you see it, the one ending number 118 was a big for four items. Somebody bought a touring tire tube, a patch kit, a bike wash kit, and a hitch rack for bike, bike rack. The question is, is there a pattern that you can use to make the predictions, to make a recommendation? So what do most people do? What most people do is actually absolutely wrong. What typically people who are not yet experienced in MBA, market basket analysis, would do is they would look for the two most popular products that sell together. A common mistake is to look for two things that sell together and promote that. Bad. This is extremely bad because it's very wrong and you will be promoting completely the wrong product. Why? Very simple reason. If two products sell together, they might sell independently together anyway. If A sells with B, A might be just a very popular product on its own. B might be a very popular product on its own. There is not necessarily a link between A and B if they are just popular. What you need to do is something quite simple, but more involved. You need to look at probability of selling A and B, probability of selling A without B, probability of selling B without A, probability of not selling A and B at all, express them as conditional probability, create a rule from A to A to B, and convert it to a logarithm. This is very easy, but most people want to have a button and an automatic technique. So thankfully, Excel has it and SQL Server does too. Let me first of all show you how easy it is in Excel before we see how it's done in SQL. In Excel, of course, this is not naked Excel. To those of you who are new to this, this is level 400 session, so not many of you, I presume, but to those of you who are new to it, I am using data mining extensions, which are hiding on those two tabs, which connect Excel to SQL Server 2008 analysis services. Excel does no work. All analysis is done by SQL. Excel is just the front end. So what do I do? I will use this lovely button over here called Shopping Basket Analysis. You see, it looks like a trolley with A pointing to B, that's the button that will do all this conditional probability analysis and express it logarithmically as necessary. So let me just hit that. Let me click on run. Data is now packaged and sent to my SQL Server 2008 Enterprise Edition installed on this machine. And once we have the patterns, it will be returned to Excel and shown as two additional sheets. The first sheet which is showing right now, shows the most popular pairs of items, and that's not the one you are interested in. Right now, this is the one that most people get hung up about, but they make a mistake by doing so. They look at that and they say, wow, road bikes and helmets, they are the most popular 
pair of items. Pair because, as you can see at the bottom, we also have sometimes triples and quadruples of popular items. But road bikes and helmets, look at that. In 805 out of my 10,000 sales, representing an average value per sale of 1,500 and an overall value of a bundle of over 1 million, you might be now tempted to think that road bikes and helmets should be recommended together. No because we still don't know if a road bike would sell independent of a helmet and a helmet independent of a road bike. If you want to know what is the recommendation to make, here is a second sheet that was added by Excel in cooperation with SQL, and that's the one we want to see. Let me just move the boundary over here. There you are. These are the seven recommendations. Really today, right now, people who are cool and buy bicycles from me want to be buying a Fender together with a mountain bike and that would lead to an additional value of linked sales of possibly over 1 million euros. That is the combination that market basket analysis found for you. Okay, so this was quite simplified and no doubt you understand the meaning of it. How do we go from here now to a more complex model and how do we use it inside your application is really what I want to talk about in this presentation in the remaining few slides before I go to the next demo. So I'm going to be switching quite a bit. Okay, market basket analysis, the grown-up big version bigger than what you have seen in Excel, is traditionally done using a technique known as association rules. That's not the only technique because you could use another which I will mention later in my presentation. Association rules, which I use for market basket analysis, cross-selling recommendations, and one of my favorite uses as a data miner, advanced data exploration, as the name suggests, creates rules for associations between things that occur at the same time. If the thing that occurs at the same time is an event of selling two products together, then it's an association of two products sold together. But that could be associations between people, people and places, telephone numbers and telephone numbers. So do not think for a second that association rules is just for market basket analysis. This is a very important mining technique, very heavily used for text analysis. And I can only guess, because I don't know, as it is a secret, but I can only guess that that technique is at the heart of what companies like Google and the other search engines use. Of course, it is a heavily tuned, modified and adjusted version, but that's the heart of it. So, as I like to do things in demos, at least in this and the previous and the next session I have today, I would like to show you market basket analysis using association rules in a little bit more detail in, at first Excel, although you could do everything I'm doing here in Business Intelligence Development Studio. Honestly, which tool you use absolutely doesn't matter. Both tools allow you to do the same thing. Which one you use depends, uh, I guess, uh, how quickly you want to get to the result. Also, bids allows you for all of the fun you have with Team Foundation Server. Excel doesn't, but Excel is sometimes a little bit, I guess, faster to, uh, to use. Anyway, so what am I going to do is I'm just going to launch into Excel, and I'm actually not going to create anything here at all. I'll go straight to the data mining tab, I check that I'm still connected to Happy Cars DM, which is analysis services database running in analysis services in SQL on this machine, and I am going to browse a model. The model I want to browse, oh, I'm, I do apologize, I actually want to connect to Happy Car, uh, to AdventureWorks. I do apologize, let me change the connection. I was doing demos in Happy Cars in my previous session. I forgot to change the connection to AdventureWorks. AdventureWorks, of course, all of you can download from codeplex.com. That's the reason I like using this for demos. Just make sure you use DW, Data Warehouse is what the DW stands for. Right, once again, I click on Browse, and using the wizard, I will browse the association rules model that is contained inside AdventureWorks for your viewing pleasure. When I click on Next, we connect to SQL Server, and let me just make it a little bit bigger, I want to show you what this algorithm does. Now, a couple of things. It's cool, but there are a few little visual bugs which Microsoft could fix. Like one of the visual bugs is that the rules don't display correctly unless you click this button and then click this button again. And now it's okay. You see they are no longer stuck to the margin. So uh, remember, magic button, show long name, 
doesn't completely do what it does. Just click it twice and everything will be fine if you ever got stuck at this point. Second thing you need to do is to clean up the display for the simplicity's sake. And I will just look at attribute name only. I will sort the rules by importance. And you immediately see that we have a rule saying touring tire tube leads to ring tire, meaning that people who selected the touring tire tube were also interested in a touring tire. And if you ever wondered what's that number 1.939, that is the logarithmic value expressing how product A links to product B taking into account all of the conditional probability. A rule has importance, but it also has a probability. Those are two different things. A probability of a rule says how frequently it has occurred. Very often, the strongest rules are not the most probable, and the most probable are opposite, of course. For example, the strongest rule we have, saying that people who buy Turing tire tubes almost always buy a Turing tire, is so strong, close to that uh, magical two in logarithmic sense, but in terms of probability, it's actually not the most frequently bought couple of items. If you are interested in importance of rules, please note that some rules will have negative importance. For example, here we have a rule with a negative importance which says that people who bought a road bottle cage do not want to see Sport 100 bicycle. It would annoy them. This is not even, there is no connection. No, there is a negative connection. If you do it in a supermarket in France, you will find that people who buy croissants do not want to see a donut in the same transaction. So what a supermarket does is they put croissants on one end of the bakery aisle and the donuts on the other, not to annoy people. But if you do exactly the same thing in America, in the United States, you will see that this is a positive rule. So those two products are brought together to simplify the way people shop. So a negative rule means it is a possibly strong rule. In this case, it's not the strongest, but it is a possibly strong rule which pulls apart. Where are the item sets? Well, as you can guess, they are here under item sets. And if we click over here, you will see, let me just clean up uh, again the display. You will see first, rather boringly, item sets uh, of one. Actually, let me um, sort them from the biggest to the smallest. Starting with item sets of three, followed by item sets of two, etc. The most frequently bought groups of items, or the most frequently occurring events together, if we don't use it for the MBA, of course, uh, application. This is not as important for recommendations, but it is, of course, important to someone who wants to find out what sells or what happens together as an event in the data set being studied. Each of those also have a support. Support in data mining, as you know, is just a number of cases found. So the higher the support, the more frequently we have seen it has bearing on the probability. But the most interesting view is the view that you will find here, the dependency network. Let me again, as soon as it appears, clean it a little. I will just show the attribute name only. And let me weaken the links to just a few interesting ones. Let me zoom in so that we can have a little bit of a journey through here. And let's see what they say. So somebody comes to the shop and says, I want a hydration pack. No problem. This hydration pack I will sell to you for, I don't know, three kroner today. If you bought a hydration pack, however, I know that you are also interested in a water bottle. That water bottle I will sell to you probably for, I don't know, 40 kroner today. Now, if you bought that, how about you buy yourself a road bottle cage to put this water bottle in? And I will sell you that at a special discount, of course, of only another 120 kroner. And since you bought now a water bottle hydration pack and a road bottle cage, could I interest you in a new bicycle, Road 750, which will cost you only, of course, 10,000 kroner. And if you are shopping like crazy, then of course you want to buy a tire, but tire needs, as you know, a tube. And if you bought that tire, how about you buy this very expensive 5,000 kroner patch kit to repair every hole in any product you have ever seen in your life? And so on, and so on, and so on. Um, you understand that what I've described here is, of course, a process that would happen in the head of somebody who understands how to sell bicycles, but your job is now to put this into your application to make the recommendations. Can you see that the answer is already here? I just need to plug one to the other? I've done my job already, really. 
everything from now on is just the plumbing, connecting the model to your application. But the most important part, understanding the model, is here, is behind you. Okay, let me close that. Uh, what can I, let me show you actually an application that does it for real. Let me switch over here to visualize it just a little bit. And what you are looking at here is one of the live demos available on sqlserverdatamining.com. I don't have a zoom it on this machine, I can't zoom that, but I will give you this link at the end of the session in case you can't see it. sqlserverdatamining.com forward slash movie click and you can play with it to your heart's content. This is a fictitious site selling or renting videos. And uh, we have many different videos that we can buy or rent from this company. Um, let me just um, scroll to show you a few of the more popular ones. Well, how about um, I want to see a beautiful mind, so I'm going to uh, click on it. This is actually running live over the internet, so my apologies if the internet is a little bit um, sluggish, but we had a little bit of um, <coughs> internet overload uh, a few minutes ago. Okay, so I'm going to add this to cart. The rest of my demos will be from this machine, so I won't be internet dependent. Um, and as soon as I've added this to cart, look, there are recommendations appearing over here. Let me just zoom into that uh, um, by magnifying it so you can see what happens over there. So basically, customers who bought A Beautiful Mind were also interested in Empire Strikes Back, Lord of the Rings, The Matrix, Raiders of the Lost Ark, and Star Wars. And of course, we could now add another product and another and see how it modifies itself. But to save you time showing you um, uh, how I browse uh, cleverly through movies on a slow working internet connection, I will only have the mouse pointer here because there is something you can borrow. This is actually the query that performs the associative prediction join lookup to find out what those recommendations are. And we are going to look at this join just in a second bit by bit uh, because really you need to understand it well. So. Let me just go back to my slides, and here we are. So we've examined the association rules, time to connect it to your application. As I already told you and shown you in that little live demo, it's about making predictions. Predictions, not of just a generic type, but specifically applying the associative model to a basket of selections, even if it's one, that the customer is making in order to find out a basket of probability, probably probability sorted recommendations to make to them. The values that you will be analyzing could be not just other products that you want to recommend, but also their color, options, configurations. In my model, I am only looking at the simplest recommendation. Product A bot leads to something else bot with no value. But you could look at product A green leads to the same product blue. Or this product with the discount leads to another product red as opposed to green. So this could be a multivalent analysis, not just a binary analysis as we do right now. Probability also must be predicted. You must predict the probability, not just the recommendation, to know whether what you are recommending passes the test of being interesting and recommendable. Of course, this is where you use the DMX, Data Mining Extensions Prediction Joint Semantics. Let me very briefly reintroduce it to those of you who haven't done it too many times. Prediction Join is a virtual join because it's not really a join of two tables. However, it is a virtual join of your model with a case on which you want to make predictions. It's extremely fast. Microsoft went crazy optimizing prediction joins for real-time live use in your websites and applications. While building the model may be slow, actually making the predictions is very, very fast. Syntax varies depending on the model which you use. So I will very briefly remind you of the generic syntax and from then on we will be looking just at the specific syntax for associative queries. So this is the generic syntax for a prediction join. What's important is the blue things. So you have expression list of things you want to predict, 
the mining model you created and the source data representing whatever you want to predict on. So the source data is the basket of things people selected now. Expression list is the names of product. Uh, or it's the name of the column that contains the product name that you are trying to predict. And the model is your association rules model like the one you've seen earlier. All the rest is uh, the syntax. Natural means, of course, that the names of columns in the model match the names of columns in the data on which you want to make predictions. And otherwise, you have to specify the on clause and do the usual column name mapping. Um, it might sound to you like uh, natural prediction joins are quicker to write. They are, but actually most of the time I see people do the mapping to save themselves on typing uh, when to do this. I'll show you what I mean on the next slide and in a demo that's coming very soon. So here is the fully blown version of the associative predict that I want you to understand very well. That's why I color coded it and that's why we will look at exactly this twice in a demo that's coming in a few minutes. So first of all, you notice that it's a little more complex than the normal prediction join. Also, you are probably noticing that it's different from what's in SQL Books Online. And the reason it's different is because it works. The one in SQL Books Online doesn't, and it will throw all sorts of errors. Part of the reason is that Microsoft updated SQL servers, but they didn't quite update SQL Books Online for that. And um, yeah, it will be updated sometime in the future, but you can have my slides if you want to take a copy of it, of course. Um, and no, it is actually not in AdventureWorks. So uh, uh, you need to get my slides or you need to get it from some of the articles available online. Otherwise, uh, you'll be figuring out for a while. Okay, what's happening over here? First of all, a prediction join normally implicitly uses a predict function. So the fact that there is a predict function mentioned over there sounds a little bit uh, redundant. There's no need normally to do it because normally select predict, prediction join is the implied syntax with a predict being omitted for simplicity, but not in an associative prediction join. Now you want to use the predict function explicitly because of the other things that are necessary to make a useful prediction. What are they? That important thing you need to include when making prediction is the probability of prediction. Otherwise, SQL will predict anything usefully, not necessarily the best prediction. It will predict anything somebody could buy. That's not what you want. You want to predict the most likely, or at least in a sorted fashion, likely things that the person is interested in. That's why the predict function uses not just the name of the column we want to predict via SOCSEC line items and include statistics. Include statistics is a very simple function reference that includes the probability, adjusted probability, variance, standard deviation, and a few other statistical things that you don't need to worry about right now. But of all of those numbers that include statistics, returns, most importantly to you, it also provides dollar adjusted probability and dollar probability. Many people use probability, not adjusted probability. This is okay, but it's not always the most interesting way to do predictions. Why? I will explain later. I have a slide on that and I have an appendix in my slide deck just about the difference about that. This is not explained in SQL Books Online at all. So pay attention to the difference when I explain it or Google it yourself and you won't find many articles. Not sure why, but it's important. The difference is important. Adjusted probability is not really probability at all. So why did they call it that? Ah. What is it really is a score of interestingness of the prediction. Adjusted probability sort predictions in the most likely order of things that you should be suggesting. How? I will explain later, but to those of you who are very curious right now, it creates, using a very simple formula, a calculation of a lift of a probability of the prediction over marginal probability of buying the other product in the basket. And if this is too much, the formula is later. But the point is, adjusted probability is the one you probably want to use most of the time. Otherwise, if you use probability, what would happen here? We would return the five 
most likely what things to recommend, which would be the most obvious things to recommend too. And then people would say, ah, that's not so interesting. I knew that anyway. It's about psychology. We'll talk about it in a minute. Adjusted probability does the job because it looks both at what's interesting and also what's not necessarily most probable. All righty, so now you understand the syntax of predict includes statistics because you want to sort it by adjusted probability and top count, of course, sorts by adjusted probability and select the five most likely items in terms of adjusted probability. Flattened because I don't want the deep structure of that, I just want the rows. So you understood the top, now what about the bottom part? This is the bit where people don't get the brackets right. Prediction join, that's the easy part, and then select, select. Two selects, one inside each other. Not one select, but two. Why? Because you are building a, not a singleton, but actually a table of items that may be in the basket. Remember that this model predicts not based just on one thing that's in the basket, but people who bought bread and who bought butter were also interested in milk but people who bought bread and butter were not interested in butter. You get that? Obviously, because they already have it. Also, people who buy bread and butter may be interested in milk because they are going to make a bread and butter pudding, whilst people who buy bread and olive oil might be interested in one of your amazing Norwegian sardines because they are just going to serve some kind of an aperitif before drinking whatever it is you like drinking. So there is a lot of logic to forcing you not to provide just one, but a table of items. And of course, what I'm doing here is I'm just providing a table with one item in it, which is just a hydration pack, like that item I selected when I was going through the graph earlier. As M, as MS, whatever, that doesn't matter, of course. And then I'm not using a natural prediction join because I prefer to say MMS, therefore I am providing that mapping. Well, of course, the top part, association.v asoc sec line items dot model, is the reference to the column that contains the name of the product. In this case, the product is stored in a column called model. And TMSM is, of course, what I just built here live. So, to summarize, this will join the model with one item in the basket, predict the five most interesting ones, and return them as a record set. Then, of course, you just recommend them to the customer. So, how does it work? Let's have a look at that in a live demo. I am going to open the query for you. Let me just make sure I'm connecting to AdventureWorks. And, as you see, that's exactly what we were studying a minute ago. Top count, adjusted probability, five items from the model called association that I call, showed you in Excel a minute ago with hydration pack SM. Let's execute the query. And there you are. People who were interested in a hydration pack were also interested in those adjusted and regular probabilities, notice that's a regular probability, the first one. The second one is the adjusted probability, which is different from the first one, sometimes dramatically different like here, because it creates a score of interestingness rather than a straightforward probability. So this is what we are sorting them by, not this probability, common mistake. So what is the most sensible recommendation to make? Water bottle. So you now display in your application, how about water bottle. People who bought this were also interested in a water bottle. So somebody now puts a water bottle in the basket. What do you do then? Well, let's simulate that. This is the extension, of course, to the previous syntax. You just create a union over here and in a select you add whatever they selected. So let's say they added that water bottle into the basket and you run the next query. So let's execute that. And now you see that people who bought a hydration pack and a water bottle would now be most interested in a road bottle cage, mountain bottle cage, road 750, and cycling cup. So what shall we add to the basket? Anyone? Road 750 did I hear? Yeah? It's the fewest letters to type, so. Okay. 
Let's see what happens now. And there you are. People who bought this are definitely interested still in that road bottle cage. You can see how that strand of recommendation is joining with the fact that they now have a road bicycle. So not just any bottle cage, but the road bottle cage. However, the other strand, the fact that they have bought a bicycle, comes into play also by recommending them a tire. So just for the last one, let's add the tire. So LL road tire SM, and let's execute that. And as you have guessed, tire tube suddenly appears as the recommendation. So uh, that's all. In fact, I could quit my session right now. I've done my job. In uh, 36 minutes, you've learned how to do a prediction engine. But I want to help you make it perfect. So let me switch back. You're looking like that. Is that all? And you can this and say, and people pay like 50,000 bucks to buy a piece of software to do that? Yeah. And 50000 is a good price with some of those products. In fact, um, I'm not going to name the company because they actually have very, very good products. That's Microsoft competitor, which is why I'm not going to mention it today, unless you ask me privately. Uh, but the product costs well over 120000 to do that. And you can do this in, don't tell Microsoft I told you, in standard edition of SQL Server. Obviously, in enterprise edition, you can do more. Did you know you have this functionality in every standard, every enterprise and developer edition? Okay, let's make it even better. So right now, what you've got is what you can, if you study carefully and spend a good few hours and you know, Google this and that or Bing this and that, find on the internet. From now on, you're gonna learn a few things that people don't tell you on the internet until they've done it a few times. Avoid being obvious. This is one of the biggest enemies to good recommendation. Look, does it make sense to recommend the most likely product, like top five in terms of real probabilities, or probability of one? What's a probability of one? Probability of one is whenever you sell something as a kit. Something is always sold with something else in a pack, perhaps, that will show in your rules with probability of one, but do you want to recommend it? No. Do you want to recommend things with 90% probability? No. I could even ask. Even if you use adjusted probability, do you still want to go for the most likely? So here comes the psychology of the shopper. And I don't know how it will work for you, but the sweet spot varies somewhere in the 30 to 60 probability range. In other words, you are recommending things which are not the most likely because they will think, oh, anyone knows that. But the things which they will look at and say, oh, that's interesting. I didn't think about it, but it makes sense. Okay. Adjusted probability is a safe way not to have to worry about that. Adjusted probability, if you use instead of worrying about specific probabilities, is a safe mechanism using interestingness that also expresses that some product is not sold by you as often. So adjusted probability will automatically create a recommendation for things that don't sell as well as they should, which is probably what your business actually wants. Okay, this is a big one. Personalizing associations. Almost no one does it well today. Even big, big supermarkets are only starting to personalize the way they recommend. Okay, they do a little. They do male-female preferences, but not much more behind that. So far, the associative model we were looking at was just a model that said if something was in the basket with something else, then there is a link between them. But association rules technique that SQL comes with can do much more than that. Using a nested case, of course, it allows you to study at case level, not just, of course, the product groupings into an order, which is what we normally use it for, but people's age, where do they live, any other data you have about them. But you can go even further than that. Rather than just look in a binary way, equals existing, have you noticed how when I was showing you the graph, I switched away from the option show product name, there was show name and value, and I always did just show name. Why? Because value was always equals existing. Did you notice that? Huh? Some of you did. 
Um, if you didn't notice, I'm going to very, very, very quickly, I'm going to talk here, don't worry, I won't switch away yet, uh, but I'm just going to launch the uh, launch Business Intelligence Development Studio to point it out in a second. But the point here is that that equals existing, which many people look at and they think, what is it all about? Well, that's basically when you are not adding any measure to analysis. You are basically looking for the presence or absence of a product in a basket. Therefore, you don't need a value. But value could be quantity, color, version, or you can go crazy. How about the success rate and a warranty repair result from the past? If you are a car dealership, you know exactly how many times people come back to complain about something. So you could have a count of complaints included and make recommendations based on people's eye color, how much they complain and what did they buy. What's the problem? You may end up having too much data, of course. More typically, you will not have enough data to analyze that, or at least you don't know yet whether your data is consistent. But the biggest problem is that you may create a model that is too detailed, effectively so detailed. Well, here's a story. Can I name the company? No, but you can guess. It's world's probably biggest online bookstore. They tried to add multivalent market basket analysis a while ago in the States, and they thought, well, adding a few personalization things. Where do you start with personalization? Of course, where do people live? So in America, very easy to do. You use a zip code, postcode. So they did that, and it worked very, very well. It was basically noticing that people who read one book in San Francisco had different preferences for other books than people who read the same book, say, um, in Columbus, Ohio. Except they didn't think how far it can go. So in America, in parts of America which are very sparsely populated, especially right in the middle, some of the areas where some of your forefathers have um, emigrated a while ago, in fact, but um, even further from there, there are households where in a zip code, one zip code, there may be only um, five, 10, or maybe 20 families living. So I must immediately say that system is no longer live on Amazon. I do apologize for that. So this is what happens. This person goes online and searches for a book for her husband on making railways, model railways, because it was a passion for the husband. So birthday book on model railway making. And she goes online and Amazon said, I'm terrible, whatever. I'm sorry. <laughs> and it says, people in your zip code who bought a book on model railway making were also interested in a book on do-it-yourself divorce. <laughs> yes, she sued Amazon. And yes, they stopped doing that. Okay, you get the idea. So worry about it, because when you have too much, the associative model will know exactly who you are. How far? I'm getting shivers on my skin because it excites me and it worries me. It excites me because technology is again ahead of the game, but it worries me because the power, the predictive power it has, does allow you to identify a person without even knowing their name. So be careful, be careful. Okay, I said I was going to quickly show you that, so let me just um, very quickly switch over. I opened Business Intelligence Development Studio in the meantime. I don't want to show any cubes or dimensions. Uh, the market basket analysis model we were looking at all the time is, of course, this one. Just very quickly to refresh it, using Microsoft Association rules here, we predict just the model. How simple is that? All I am including is just the name of the product. Remember, model, kind of funny way here, means the name of a product. So not a particularly overly rich way to do it. Nothing should stop you from adding at this level, here at the top, all the demographic zip codes, etc. Or over here, values are the columns to whatever that product was, such as color, quantity, and so on. And when you look at the viewer, and that's really the thing I wanted to show you. Ugh. Okay, uh, that needs to refresh itself. I haven't um, updated the server, so it would just take a couple of seconds. There is a little selector where you look at whether it's a binary or a non-binary um, uh, uh, predictor. Most of your predictions, if you are doing this for the first time, will be binary. There will be equals existing, equals missing, or equals existing or other, but it is worthwhile noticing where you could do a more advanced form. Uh, so what happens right now is, of course, um, because uh, 
you know, there's always this rule. Don't do a demo on the fly um, if you suddenly feel like doing it because um, something will pop up. So what's popping up is that I should have rebuilt this model earlier. Um, it will finish in a minute or so, but when it finishes, um, I think it will be valuable for you to, uh, to observe uh, where that option is. Oh, that, 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 it's finished. Deployment uh, completed. Now it's retrieving, and there you are. Do remember the little visual bug? Click that button once, click that button twice. Or write yourself a macro that clicks the button. See here, Turing tire existing, Sport 100 existing, leads to Turing tire tube existing. That's exactly what I'm talking about, no measure. All we are caring for is that we have a Turing tire and a Sport 100 in the market, sorry, in the basket, therefore we are saying there should be Turing tire tube. Interestingly, you can generate rules for equals missing, and those are the negative rules, of course. So most of the time when you do a binary analysis, you select from here, show attribute name only, because people are not looking into colors, etc., and this is the more familiar way to look at it. But this is precisely where you might want to look at the values if you are doing a more advanced, more accurate way of performing this prediction. Okay. Another thing that you can do to make it more accurate, and this is a pretty cool way, is actually not to use association rules at all. So I've spent, uh, what, 46 minutes of my time telling you about Microsoft association rules to tell you not to use it? Indeed, but only for a very, very small catalog of items. If you have significantly fewer than 100 items to look at, you could use decision trees. Good old decision trees, yeah, but with a nested case. If you ever, ever wondered what's the difference between a nested and a non-nested decision tree, that's the answer. A non-nested flat decision tree is just a decision tree. A nested decision tree is actually association rules with more information but without the rules. So as such, it's a little bit more convoluted how you make a prediction. You can learn much more about what happens, especially in terms of those values, demographics, etc. but it only works for a small catalog. If you've got more than 100, you're like, what, medium-sized supermarket? Do you know how many items a medium-sized supermarket has on a shelf? 10,000. That's a medium-sized supermarket, has 10,000 items. Anything like that, this wouldn't work. You would just have too many, too many trees. Let me show you that quickly. In order to do that, I will close Adventure Works and I will go to uh, an example I like using often, which I prepared with my colleagues earlier, called Happy Cars. This is a car dealership, and uh, if you were to my previous session, you've already seen it. But the point I'm making here is that there are two decision trees. One is flattened, just as you see, one flat table representing demographics and flattened into it the brand, model, and type of the car sold to the customer. If I explore this just to show you uh, what's there, you can see, for example, our good friend Elizabeth Johnson, who bought um, five or six cars from me, five, and you can actually see flattened, denormalized into that what they were. There you are, in the middle, you can see that she bought um, a Wagon Tassat Sedan, a Wagon Taran Minivan, a Vuvu S14 Estate, and a Kexus XL SUV. So those are the cars that she was interested in buying. You can analyze it the old-fashioned way like you've learned to do uh, decision trees. Let me show you in the viewer a uh, normal decision tree. And there you are. You find out. Actually, it's even better to look at the dependency network. And voila, you find out that there is a relationship between these input attributes um, in the strength and the type, brand, and model of the car. For example, gender impacts on the type of car people buy, how much money they do also, and so on and so on. But the decision tree in itself is just a decision tree for buying um, all brands of cars. Notice what will happen if instead of doing that, we will analyze exactly the same data in a nested fashion. So now, for the first time, I am, today at least, not flattening the customer's table, but I have a nested table representing the brand sold. So this is the same data, exactly the same data you had before, but with a relationship between them. And some people think that the reason Microsoft allows for that is just to let you be lazy and not to have to flatten it. No you will get completely different results when you analyze it flattened from when it's nested. 
And the understanding of the difference is exactly what I want you to see. Because the difference will be that now the same decision tree, we are still using a decision tree here, but albeit with the nested reference to the brand of the car bought, actually produces an associative decision tree and is completely different in result. Look at that. The mining bundle viewer now builds me not one, but one, two, three, four, five, six different decision trees. A different decision tree for each product. That's why I said if you have more than 100, you will end up having a big forest of trees. So it becomes less and less useful to analyze it. And for each individual brand, you can understand that for Lamborghini buyers, yeah, gender is most important, whether it's male or, sorry, actually marital status not gender. So single people, as you can see, tend to buy that. And uh, if you understand the certain trees as you do, no doubt very well, the biggest uh, dependency is on whether they already have a Porsche or not. And if they have a Porsche, of course, um, it changes their probability. But let's look at something more popular like a Vuvu. For a Vuvu, this is definitely a more typical decision tree looking at people's income, followed by uh, whether they have a Toyota or a wagon or another car. So this is a much more in-depth look at the way people will shop. And just to summarize that on a dependency network, you will see that now this model is not a generic model between gender and brand, but specifically leads to known brands. So in this model, if you compare that to this, here, notice, we just have relationship of columns to columns, columns to columns. Whilst what do we have here? Here, just zoom in on that, we don't have columns to columns, but we have columns to the values of the nested key. And that is way, way more advanced. That, in essence, is an associative decision tree, an advanced form of associative analysis, particularly good for analyzing less than of small catalogs of items. And if you are wondering what are the gender preferences, just to have a little bit of fun, you can see that gender impacts on Porsche, income on those, and um, the number of children you have impacts on a wagon and a Vuvu. But also notice that Vuvu leads to others, and there are also links between the items, so it is still an associative model. Not many people realize that decision trees from Microsoft have that additional power. All you need to do is have a nested case. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, in order to conclude, I would like to very quickly remind you of the whole process and then give you some references. So first and foremost, as I have already shown you earlier, you start by preparing your database of receipts, sales, or events for mining, which means flattening to some level at least. You create and train an associative model on it, or decision tree with associations. You, of course, as always, validate and test the model before you go further. Now you use it. And the use really means just one thing, the prediction join. The prediction join is all you need in order to predict and recommend the product to the customer. Optionally, you make the logic of your application depend on the outcome of the prediction. And of course, you don't forget to update and revalidate the model as the preferences people have for shopping, no doubt, will change and evolve. So, in order to push you a little bit further, in summary, association rules, data mining technique creates a recommendation model, especially for market basket analysis purposes. The engine is just the prediction join, and it is extremely fast for predicting. Not so fast for building the model, but you do that only nightly or weekly, so not so often. The predictions are totally real-time, high-grade, scalable enterprise application for whatever purposes you need to use. So hopefully, all of you will want to try predicting something today. Make your own recommendations today by using SQL Server Management Studio, Excel, or Business Intelligence Development Studio, whichever product uh, suits you. I'm going to leave this slide as I take a few questions just in a second. SQLServerDataMining.com is where MovieClicks sits and you can look up that prediction joint syntax over there. My five and a half hour free of charge seminar on data mining is on Microsoft.com forward slash TechNet Spotlight. And there is, of course, the book by Jacques Huitang and Jamie McLennan and a few other blogs and resources are for you to look at. Now, I have finished with uh, five and a half minutes spared to take a few questions. So uh, is there anybody here who would like to ask one? Please. Could you recommend any solutions for the smaller businesses like the ones whom you might, I know, a few million euros, 10 turnover? Okay. 
the gentleman is asking a question whether I would recommend this or perhaps other solutions for smaller businesses with a turnover of a few or less million euros. Well, first of all, absolutely, and I wouldn't necessarily say it's quite small because in some countries that's already medium-sized business. Of course, if we look at it from an American perspective, then it's different, but they also have the biggest debts now, I guess. I get your point. So the question is, where do you actually see the biggest kick? That's a better question than the first one you've asked, if you don't mind me criticizing your first question. Um, and I do apologize for doing that. But indeed, when you have a very small business, you know it here. You don't need anything like that. So the margins you will generate by this, OK, do it in Excel. Surprise yourself that it will tell you something you didn't know. It's really when you start growing that you stop knowing and you start relying on what uh, they tell you. The margins, in my experience, the difference is biggest for a business that's not too big, that has grown and has got a little bit lost. What happens? And you need to help them. And this is where Microsoft comes and says, by the way, did you know that standard edition of SQL is all you need? And people say, wow, I didn't know that. And indeed, it is. And I do apologize to uh, Microsoft because I should be pointing out that if you've got particularly large data sets or you want to optimize it, uh, fine tune it, blah, blah, all of the other things, then the enterprise edition is the better one to use. But uh, when money is sensitive as it is now, Excel and SQL standard. Did you hear Microsoft project code name Gemini by any chance? Mm, some of you are wondering, what is that? Gemini, we don't know when, but probably next year probably around the time frame of the next Microsoft Office, uh, Office 2010, but we don't know when exactly. Microsoft will be issuing the next wave of their business intelligence products, specifically concentrating on what they noticed. People use SQL and Excel and bids together in smaller businesses. So what they decided to do is they decided to take from SQL <laughs> the entire analysis services engine with data mining, all up cubes, et cetera, and put it inside Excel. Yep. SQL inside Excel? Yep. All up? Yeah. And now you may be thinking, but I don't have memory to do that on my little laptop. No worries. They actually have patented a pretty cool compression technology that uh, allows you to do all of this analysis in memory without having to decompress the data. So it's a pretty magical set of things for that market space that you have mentioned about. So not only yeah, but that's the direction. We see that that's where an awful lot of money will be made in the future. The big boys, of course, enterprise edition, etc., and their margins will be smaller because they probably already have something. I have time for one more question, especially if I answer more rapidly. Would anyone want to ask another question? Yes, please. Are there any open source solutions that are nearly as good? Nearly as good? The gentleman asked a very important question, are there any open source solutions which are nearly as good? Well, first of all, there is an awful lot of open source stuff that uh, is there and that you should be aware of. Go to www.kdnuggets, KD like knowledge discovery, nuggets like chicken nuggets, .org, kdnuggets.org, and you'll find a plethora of free to get and not necessarily so free to maintain later solutions. What I want you to do is if you find something which is better than this, is to remember that most of those solutions don't come with a SQL Server enterprise great database engine. Sorry, in the world there's MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, DB2, and a few others. And um, SQL Server is pretty good for what it has been good for years. It scales well, it's nice in an enterprise. What you can do now is you can take that KD Nuggets open source routine that you found and you can actually put it inside SQL Server because the data mining engine in SQL is completely extensible. Microsoft gives you nine algorithms of which one is association rules. If you find a better one, plug it in. How do I do that? SQLServerDataMining.com shows you how to do it. Uh, yeah, you have to be a bit of a developer because there are some parameters you have to connect, but it's not very complex. And then answer the question yourself whether that open source solution is better or worse than the one Microsoft has because you will have a side-by-side -side comparison. Oh, that's a better answer than I thought I was going to give. <laughs> Okay, ladies and gentlemen, as it is uh, only 20 seconds before my allotted end of time slot, all that remains for me to do is to thank you very much and I hope to see you in my other sessions today. Enjoy and goodbye.